Um, so you see standing before you um, what I like to call a, a, a child who suffered much growing up. And you might think that I'm going to talk about the suffering of growing up as a black child under apartheid, but I'm not. I'm going to talk about the suffering of growing up a literal-minded African child. Now, that might not sound like it is such a challenge or a hardship, but if you know anything about African culture, you will know that almost all education in the African community is done through proverbs. And our proverbs are not like English proverbs, you know, which as soon as you hear them, almost all of them, you can make sense of what it's saying. You know, a stitch in time saves nine. That makes sense. If you're careful, then you won't have to go back and fix everything. A penny saved is a penny earned. Again, that, you, that doesn't take so much thinking to understand the lesson behind the proverb. But our proverbs are not like that. Our proverbs say things like, the elephant does not find its own trunk heavy. Now, imagine yourself a literal-minded African child being dropped this pearl of wisdom. My first thought is, which elephant? And who asked the elephant whether or not it found its trunk heavy? Or one, one of my, my grandmother's favorites was, the child who does not cry dies on its mother's back. So this woman, put a child on her back and forgot that she had another human being on her back because the child didn't cry and forgot it long enough for the child to die on her back? Which woman is that? I mean, and I, by that point, I've carried babies on my back. You do not forget you have a baby on your back no matter how quiet the child. So. Seriously, what? Who is this? Who is carrying a dead baby on her back and let the baby die? So for me, all of these proverbs were really challenging, trying to make sense of what is the lesson that these people are trying to teach me. And today I want to base my, uh, my presentation on two of those proverbs. And one it says, in the time of floods, the wise build bridges, the foolish build walls. Literal-minded Naomi, it's flooding. Why are you building anything? Get out should be all you need to do. And, you know, as I grew up and people started explaining them and I started paying more attention to the beauty of the story underneath. So in the time of flood, the wise build bridges, the foolish build walls, is talking not about a literal flood, thank goodness, and it's talking not about literal bridges or literal walls, it is talking about in times of crisis and hardship, the wise reach out, build community, find allies, find ways of finding common ground with people who they might not have thought of building common ground with when everything was nice and peaceful and hunky-dory. And yet, the foolish in times of difficulty, in times of crisis, actually try even harder to divide themselves away from people, build up walls between themselves and their neighbors, try and find somebody else to blame for the difficulty that they are in, rather than saying, we are in a time of difficulty, we need all the heads and hearts and hands and feet that we can possibly use in order to get through. And so, for me, 
that became one of the few of those proverbs that I have held on to in my life growing up has been the idea that, in fact, difficulty should be what pushes us to look for new people to connect with. That difficulty, that crisis, that hardship should be the thing that says to us, clearly, we need a different way of looking at what is going on. And those of us who have been at this table forever have clearly not come up with a solution. So what we need to do is pull in more people with different perspectives, with different ideas, who can help us then move out of this time of crisis. And as I said, this has been what I have used in my own life, even in, you know, pretty petty things. Like when I first moved to Nashville, I moved to Nashville to work at um, the Race Relations Institute at Fisk University. And when I first moved, I moved there with two little children and knew nobody in town and was trying to think of ways to make connections. And I, I must tell you that this was a time of crisis for me. Um, I had had at home always other adults around me, family, extended family, so to help me with raising my children, that my children knew that even when their mother is acting crazy, there is another adult in the house or down the street who they can turn to who will not be crazy at the same time as your mom. And, and so we found ourselves in Nashville staring at each other, being crazy, all three of us at the same time. Um, and I found that just by getting to know neighbors, getting to talk to daycare workers, teachers at my children's school, that I, I started having a community in Nashville, a community that gave me new ideas of how to deal with the difficulties of being a single parent, but also a community that lifted me up in times when I just felt like I was at the end of my tether. And I found the very same thing in doing the work of racial justice, that it has been in the times when I want to just throw up my hands and say, I'm done. There is nothing else that I can do. I am tired. I cannot deal with one more story of racial injustice. I can't walk out of my house one more time facing a community that looks at me or at my children as, as somebody suspicious or dangerous. And then I've seen somebody's story that has nothing to do with racial justice, that might have something to do with joining a gym or something to do with a cooking class, and thought, oh, wait a minute. This is somebody I haven't talked to about my life, about the challenges, and maybe in the gym or in the cooking class, there will come ideas and thoughts that help at cooking, help at exercising, but also might help me in thinking a different way about the challenges that I am facing right now. And I have looked at the people who I have thought of as the best leaders, the people who I have thought of as heroes, and always they too have been people who in times of hardship, in times of crisis, actually reach out rather than closing doors, reach out to make connections with people who you wouldn't expect them to. 
So one of my favorite stories about Nelson Mandela is about his experience in, on Robben Island when he, was, when he was held there for almost 30 years. And what we found, subsequently found out was that when guards were sent to Robben Island um, to be guarding people like Mandela, they were warned that you are going to be dealing with hate-filled people, people who want to destroy our country. You are going to be dealing with terrorists, the most evil people that you can imagine, that you are going to be dealing with communists, because at that point in South Africa, you, anything bad was labeled communist. So you need to be prepared to, to face this evil. You need to be strong human beings to withstand this evil that is going to, to come against you. And then from his God's own stories, we hear that whenever they interacted with President Mandela, they spoke about meeting a human being who saw them as human beings who talked to them, who wanted to know their stories, who wanted to know about their families, who asked them questions about what they loved and what they hated. He had guards who said, you know, within a month of guarding Mandela, he knew more about me than my commander who I had been working for for years that he showed an interest in me. Even to the extent of having one of the guards tell him that, you know, I have a son who is truly, truly clever. He is a brilliant young man and he should go to university. But there is no way that my wife and I can afford to send him to college. And President Mandela, from prison, reached out to those who were supporting him and his family during this time and said, my God's son needs a scholarship to university. I need you to raise money so that this young man can go to college. And they did. And for this God, this was the beginning for him for questioning, so if they've lied to me about this man, what else have those who lead me lied to me about? What else have they told me about black people that might not be true? What else have they taught me about apartheid that might not be true? What else have they told me about the need to separate us from other races that might not be true. So because one person, one person said, I am going to reach out in this time of hardship and crisis, I am going to reach out to this person who I am told is meant to be my enemy. The questions spread from the God to his family, to his son, about what is it that we are upholding in our country? And how would a change actually maybe make our life better? So this one person building a bridge to one other person started a conversation and not, not, I won't even go as far as to say a movement, but at least started a community of people who had fully supported apartheid in the process of thinking, what else is possible? What else might our country look like if we were not separated completely from people of other races. That this idea that in the time of crisis, the wise reach out. The wise reach out and listen with new ears to the stories 
particularly of those whom they know as other. And that is what we are called to be. We are challenged to be the wise. The wise who look at our communities and ask ourselves, who is not at this table? And rather than thinking that if we bring them to the table, they are going to take away something from us, rather think if we bring them to the table, imagine the different ways that we can look at these same problems. Imagine the different perspectives that we will get access to. Imagine the different hearts that will be invested in our community as full community members. So that's the one. In the time of flood, the wise build bridges and the foolish build walls. Are we going to be the wise in our lives or are we going to be the foolish? And the second proverb that I, I wanted to, to talk about today is one that um, I talk about a lot because it's one that I heard a lot, way more than I ever wanted to hear anything because this was my parents' favorite proverb. And the proverb in Kasa, my mother tongue, says, umtu gumtu gabantu. A person is a person through other people. And, uh, you know, at, at its most fundamental, the, 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 the proverb is saying that we learn how to live in community, we learn how to be with one another by watching those around us. So that as a child, we learn what language we need to be speaking from listening to the language around us. We learn the words that we use. We learn the proper ways of eating. We learn the proper ways of greeting. We learn the proper ways of interacting with other people by watching those around us. We learn it is that human community that really teaches us how to be human. So, um, and, and so that, that is the, you know, the fundamental, like the most basic, almost the biological um, teaching of the proverb. But the deeper meaning of the proverb is that we are only human, in fact, in community with other human beings and that you cannot do something for or against another human being without doing something for or against yourself. That every action you take on behalf of somebody has a payback, if you like, for yourself. Every action you take against another human being has an impact on you. And in our culture, children are first introduced to this proverb in their daily lives because we, when we were growing up, it's changed now, our children are, are very westernized, but when we were growing up, um, for instance, in my grandmother's house where we all lived with my parents and my cousins, the, the adult who was dishing up the food would dish up the food in one big plate for all the children and then give the dish to the oldest child and in giving the child the dish would say umtu gumtu gabantu remember a person is a person through other people and what that what they were trying to say is as the oldest and probably the biggest of these children you could eat more than your fair share of what is in this bowl but in doing that you would not only have deprived your siblings and cousins of their fair share of food, but you would have also diminished yourself 
as a human being. And so growing up, my parents threw this proverb at us all the time. I mean, you know, when we would be fighting, well, I wasn't fighting because I'm the holy one, but, <laughs> but when the other three would be fighting, uh, you know, my, the, and yelling at each other and calling each other names, my mom or dad would say, remember, umtung umtung as you are talking about how terrible your sister is and how much you hate her, you are showing us a part of you that is not very attractive. And you might want to think that what is it about the action of your sibling that brought this out in you? Who are you in this instance? Or my, my favorite time my parents would throw this out is when I, when I was growing up through um, middle, high, and even college, I played field hockey. And I would, <laughs> yay, right? I know, people don't appreciate field hockey well enough, <laughs> seriously. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, I would come home after a match and say, I scored the winning goal. And I promise you, my parents would say, remember, umtu, gumtu, gabantu. I mean, I say, seriously, if the rest of the team had not been on the field, would you have been able to score that goal? You needed that set up from whoever set you up. You needed your defenders to be there to stop the ball going to your goal. You did not do this on your own. And I'd be like, yeah, okay. But the, what, what remains is I scored the winning goal. Uh, so I mean, so often we did not take the lesson in in the way that my parents wanted us to. And I remember the first time that I thought I finally understood some of the wisdom of the proverb. Um, and when I told my parents this, they said, mm, not quite, but you're getting there. Because my, my introduction to thinking, oh, this does make sense, is when we lived in England um, and I went, my older sister and I went to an all-girls high school um, in Kent. And we wore, everybody wore school uniform, right? So there were 800 girls. And if, if out of those 800 girls, three or four are acting up and a teacher comes into the hallway and sees them, but they run away really quickly and all they see, and that, that teacher doesn't have them in their class, and all they see are uh, four or five girls in navy blue skirts and white shirts with a maroon tie. How are they going to know who it was, right? That's why I love school uniform. No, that's not why I love school uniform. But that's why I love school uniform. Um, except, I said 800 girls, right? Except in my case, there were only two black girls out of those 800. Me and my older sister. And my older sister is one of those, we called her Saint Teresa of the Blessed Can Do No Wrong. <laughs> Every family has one. You know, the one who comes home and does their homework right away. The one whose room is always tidy. The one who, when there are guests, is the one who offers, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> is the one who offers to make tea right away. Mom, can I make you and the guests tea? Sit your butt down, girl. Always, there's always that one, you know, who is uh, trying for sainthood in their teenage years. So when m my friends and I started acting up in school, all the teacher had to say who saw us was, uh, the little tutu was there. <laughs> and then they knew who all my friends were, and we were rounded up all, often and often. In fact, my mom says that she thinks that the school had a secretary who was employed simply to write letters to them about me. <laughs> so, um, and so, uh, and so, because this was a school for uh, young women, the only punishment that they gave out was, you know, either the writing of lines or detention. That is staying in school after school. So I had detention 
so much. I mean, I needed to be paying rent in those detention rooms. And some of you probably have never been in detention because you are some of those St. Teresa's of the Blessed Can Do No Wrong. But those of us who've been in detention know that there's not much you can do in detention. You either sit there and do your homework or you read a book or you contemplate the world's great mysteries. And I loved contemplating the world's great mysteries because I hated homework and there's only so much reading you can do, right? Uh, one day as I was sitting there in detention contemplating the world's great mysteries, it suddenly came to me that now I get the proverb. Because, true, in that room, missing out on doing fun stuff in the afternoon with our friends were those of us being punished. So there we are being punished and we're sitting in that room and we're bored. But also in the room with us is the person punishing us. And I'm thinking, I know you've got better things to do with your time than be sitting here on a Wednesday afternoon for two hours watching a group of girls who you're punishing. And so I went home and I was like, I get the proverb now because that teacher who was punishing us, she was getting punished too. And my mom and dad were like, oh Lord, no, no. <laughs> that is not the teaching of the proverb, my child. But you're getting there, you're getting there. You can see how there is an impact on you on what you do. But this is not the example we would have chosen you to try and use it on. And, but then having done that, I started thinking about the Proverbs truth in the context of South Africa. And in the context of South Africa, you know, we grew up during apartheid, knowing that all the best things in the country were reserved for whites. They lived in the nice neighborhoods, they had the best schools, they had parks and cinemas and libraries, they had access to, they, were, uh, they had freedom of movement, they could live in any city that they wanted to, which we could not do because of past laws. They, they had um, the options for the best jobs because of the Job Reservations Act. They had access to the best education because of the Bantu Education Act. So they had all this amazing stuff. And, and you would think, so where is the impact on them of their oppression of us? And for me growing up, it was really hard to see that impact. But then as I started to unpack how this proverb me works is that, you know, the meaning is not a completely direct correlation, but South Africa, white South Africans were as oppressed, maybe more oppressed than we were. And why I say that is because with all of this great privilege that apartheid gave them, they lived constantly in fear. They were constantly afraid that these privileges would be taken from them. They bought more guns per head than almost any country. They built higher and higher walls around their homes. They conscripted their sons to serve in the military, not to serve at the border to protect from any enemy invasion, but to serve in the country to keep black South Africans oppressed. And yet, no matter what they did, it didn't matter how many laws they passed. It didn't matter how many people they arrested. It didn't even matter how many people they killed. They remained afraid. And they could not not be afraid as long as that system was built on the oppression of people of color. And so I came to realize that 
they were, in a sense, more oppressed than we. And the reason I say that is that they did all of these things to maintain a system that kept them in fear. While we struggled and fought and died, but fought and died for our liberation. So there is a way in which if you are hanging on so tight to your privilege based in fear that you are suffering more than those struggling to loose their chains. So I began to think about maybe this proverb that I had often felt like my parents threw out at the slightest provocation or no provocation at all did indeed have lessons for us in the world. That it did indeed have a wisdom about being human beings in community, about being people sharing the same city, state, country, planet. That if we thought hard and deep about how our actions impacted others and then tried our hardest to be doing those things that improved others' lots, trying our hardest to doing those things that gave more opportunities to more people, that in fact we would be building more opportunities for ourselves. That if we took this proverb as our starting place in thinking about how we lived at home with our families, how we dealt at school with our colleagues and the children that we teach, how we dealt in our governments, how we dealt in all our institutions, thinking that how is what I am planning to do going to impact the person who I am taking this action for or against? And how is that action going to redound, rebound on me? That we would be building schools, communities, cities, universities, churches that looked very different to the way that our institutions look now. That we would be looking at its impact on everyone because we knew that the impact on others was an impact on ourselves. So as I have grown up, these two proverbs, which as I said, when I was, when I was little seemed to me like real pains, like really stupid sometimes. And with umtung umtung abantu like a scratched record other times, the way my parents threw it around, have come to me now in my adult life to actually be things that I think are good guides, good ways of thinking of my actions with my children, actions with friends, actions in the work that I do, and, and things that I want to share with others, to ask, think, in this particular action, am I building a bridge or am I erecting a wall? Think, in this particular action, Am I recognizing my connection with the person who I am dealing with? Or am I trying to pretend that 
this is just some sterile lab experiment and that there isn't another human being on the receiving end and I, I am not fully human at the giving end. So I ask you, Are there places in your life, are there places in your work that you are called to build bridges when the easier thing would be to build walls? Are there places in your life, are there places in your work where you are called to remember that you are fully human and those you work with or against are fully human too. Remember, umtu gumtu gabantu. A person is a person only through other people. Thank you.